telescope size and resolution. In the first section of this chapter, I talked about the fact that observation leads the way in astronomy. And to make better observations, guess what? You need bigger and better telescopes. Why bigger? It's like having a larger eyeball and being able to just collect more light. That's just the first step. You need more light. And it depends on the surface area of the lens, or in most cases, the mirror that you're using, the surface area. Now, a, a mirror is circular in shape. And so you think of area, you think of pi r squared. And so the brightness of a telescope is proportional to the diameter of its mirror. To give an example, uh, when you buy, let's say, a Dobsonian, um, it, they come in sizes that are like six inch mirrors, eight inch, 10 inch, 12 inch, and so forth. Well, uh, you, most people would think, oh, well, you're just barely going up, you know, from an eight inch scope to a 10 inch scope. But that's actually a really large change in surface area. So a small change in diameter, uh, because what counts is the area, a small change in diameter is actually a large change in area. Uh, so to give you an example, let's say you had a, a 10 inch scope versus a two inch scope. Here's how the math works. If you wanna compare two telescopes, you basically take the, the two numbers and divide them. In this case, 10 inch divided by two inch, you get five and then you square it. So a 10 inch scope is gonna give you a 25 times brighter image than a two inch scope. So divide and square, the math is very easy. That's how it works. Now, here's another way to look at it. You might look at it this way. You know, technically speaking, yeah, the 10 inch scope is brighter and that way you can see dimmer things. Now you might think, well, but with a two inch scope, um, you might be able to, to leave that on an object for a long time and, and, and get uh, an image, you know, get a good image too. And, and you can, uh, but time wise, think about that. That means the 10 inch scope is 25 times faster. So if you're doing an hour long exposure of a galaxy, uh, and you could do it in an hour with your 10 inch scope, it's gonna take you 25 hours of time. You're not gonna be able to do it with your, you know, just a little two inch scope. So bigger is better uh, with telescopes. So what are the largest telescopes? This is always fun to look at. Um, it depends on how you look at it, but the, the VLT, which stands for, I'm not making this up, one of the most advanced instruments on earth stands for very large telescope. The very large telescope in Chile is actually four extremely large telescopes that can work together in what's called an interferometer. When they do all work together, they function like a 16 meter wide telescope. So we're, we're gonna go ahead and count that as the largest one on earth. But remember, it's actually four telescopes. The Keks in Hawaii are each 10 meters wide. Uh, when they do function together as an interferometer, we call it, when they function together, they behave like a 14 meter wide mirror. I don't even think they do that anymore. It's just so complicated and difficult to do. But soon these titles um, aren't gonna matter anyway because they're both gonna get beat soon by, for example, the giant Magellan Telescope, which is being built in Chile uh, right now. And, it, and you're gonna see it in just a few minutes. It has seven uh, very large mirrors, eight meter wide mirrors working together in one giant scope. And then the TMT, uh, which I think is going to be built and probably in Hawaii, that's still a little bit up in the air. Now the giant Magellan functions, I believe as about like a 22 meter wide scope when it's built. And then the TMT literally stands for 30 meter telescope. So you can guess how wide uh, that one's going to be. Anyway, um, this is an example problem. I'll just wait and uh, do this one in class. Basically, how long would it take a telescope? Well, we'll just do it with a nine inch aperture compared to a three inch. So you're gonna divide the two. Nine divided by three is three. So that means the, the large telescope is, is um, when you square it, then it's nine divided by three, which is three. Then you square it as nine. It's nine times faster. So if the um, small scope, takes 45 minutes, the large scope being nine times faster, or in other words, it can do the job in one ninth the time. So 
five minutes is the answer. Yeah, the big scope would only take five minutes to do that job. So you can do a whole lot of five minute uh, astro photos in the time it takes somebody with a small scope to do just one single image of similar quality. So that's kind of how it works. Here is the famous VLT. I didn't get to visit it in Chile. It was kind of off of our path there, but uh, pretty amazing. Look at that, four giant, four of the largest telescopes in the world all together, and they can function together. Uh, to build this, it was in such a remote area, they actually blew the top off a mountain there, and the very first piece of equipment went up by donkey. Fun fact. Yeah, that's how remote it is. They didn't have a road there. The largest single mirror on Earth currently in 2018 belongs to the Gran Telescopio de las Canarias in the Canary Islands, or Grand Tecan, it's sometimes called for short. There it is on this island in the clouds. That'd be an interesting place to go to work, wouldn't it? Look at that, how isolated that looks up there. Beautiful. And above that sea, above the atmosphere, it's exactly what you want. All right, so here's a look uh, in the past and a look at the present and the future of large mirrors. Um, some ones I'd like to point out, I already mentioned the VLT. Let's take a look here if my cursor will work. Where is it? Right there. So there's the VLT currently, what they look like separately and what they kind of function as together. Um, then you have right here, the giant Magellan, which is being built seven mirrors, same mirrors, same exact mirrors, actually all built at the University of Arizona. Uh, but there are four of them with the VLT and there are going to be seven of them at the GMT. And some other ones, and there are the Kex. Now, you notice the Kex and the Grand Tecan, those are segmented mirror designs. They use these hexagonal pieces. So it's a very different way to build a mirror. And they're basically twins. They are all just about the same 10 meters across. You notice that the, the next generation here, the 30-meter telescope, when and if it's built, will also use the segments. And one that's being built in Chile uh, eventually they have the site for it, the European Extremely, yes, yeah, I know, very large telescope. What beats that? The Extremely Large Telescope. So there it is. Uh, that is going to be built, and it's ridiculous. Look at the bottom of this. Look, there's a, a tennis court and a basketball court for reference. Th th these things are unbelievable. Um, there's the GMT, just a computer design here of what it looks like. And um, see if you know what kind of design. Look, the mirror it bounces off the main mirrors up to the secondary mirror and through an opening in the primary. Do you remember what that's called? What design? It's a Casa Grain design. And if you're not impressed, look at the person down there, right down there on the bottom left to give you some scale of the GMT. We're going to watch some videos that show a little bit about some of these. I won't watch the whole thing, but just a little bit about each one. astronomers to study such mysteries as the formation of the early universe, black holes, dark matter, dark energy, and the origin and evolution of planetary systems. This telescope will feature a large segmented primary mirror, consisting of seven individual 8.4 meter diameter mirrors on a common mount, providing the resolving power of a 25 meter or 80 foot mirror. 25 meter. I'm sorry, I think I said 22 earlier, 25 meter. Here they are, the giant Magellan being built now, the European extremely large and the 30 meter side by side. Let's see if this one plays a little bit. Two meters. It's ridiculous. That's it compared to the VLT and the Roman Colosseum for scale. Unbelievable. So that's a look at the next generation of telescopes. Now, Having a large telescope doesn't do you any good if you have a blurry image. So the other big factor that's equally important, it's not just how bright it is, but how sharp it is, the resolving power, the resolution of the telescope. So at the bottom, to give you an example of what we mean by angular resolution, here's a picture of something 
in the sky from the Earth, looking up through our blurry atmosphere. Now that object is actually Pluto and its largest moon. And in that picture on the left, you can't really designate between the two objects. You can't distinguish between them, but the HST, that'd be the Hubble Space Telescope, look at that, can um, resolve there between Pluto and Charon. Pretty neat example there of resolution. So that's what you want to be able to do with a telescope. Now, I just mentioned the atmosphere. That is the big problem, whether it's your backyard telescope or the, the greatest telescopes on Earth. You all have this problem. You're looking up through a sea of air. It's what causes stars to quote unquote twinkle. Astronomers don't like twinkling stars. We don't like that at all. That means the air is moving around a lot. It's, it's poor seeing, we call it. So where do you want to have an observatory? Where do you want a telescope? High, dry, and dark. That's my own little phrase for this. You want high, dry, and dark. We've already mentioned Chile, the premier place in the world for astronomy. Hawaii is probably second. Arizona's up there as well. And, and what do they have in common? They're high, dry, and dark. High elevation, dark. They're away from city lights and they're above the moisture of the atmosphere and so forth and so on. Of course, the ultimate solution is to have a telescope in space, which is why the Hubble was such a, a giant leap forward. At the time when it started working in 1993, it was 20 times better than any other telescope. 20 times better. That, that's just an amazing leap in technology. That's, it's just revolutionary. And, and to this day, as, as I'm speaking, the Hubble is still, you know, one of the premier telescopes, of course. Anyway, uh, just real quickly here, here we are in Chile visiting uh, one observatory. It's a place called Cerro Tololo. And um, that was part of my ASAP group there. Just wonderful people enjoyed that trip. But you can see, look at that, high, dry, and dark. That, that kind of sums it up where we're at right there. I'll t play just a bit of this from where we were at a site called Alma, if it'll play here. This is the Atacama Desert, one of the driest places on Earth. And up the mountain is Alma, the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array. And because it operates in the microwave part of the spectrum, you know, you know, microwave works because of water in the, in the food. You have frozen food, water molecules vibrate. Well, that's great for cooking food, but it's not great for doing astronomy. We don't, uh, astronomers don't want that uh, water vapor in the atmosphere. So it gets down to about 2% humidity here um, and it goes for years without a drop of rain so it really is it's the the highest desert in the world i believe and uh, this is why they built that uh, facility here it's an amazing facility and tomorrow morning we are going up to the high site at sixteen thousand feet i can't wait and i'll talk more about alma specifically uh, later in this chapter, but I just wanted to kind of introduce that to just you see the parched ground there the desert how incredibly dry So here's an example here uh, in another climate this on the in the in the Pyrenees there between France and Spain I believe I just thought it was beautiful. I've never been there to that particular location All right, so how do you make it? Uh, uh, really clear well one way that we can actually beat the atmosphere and actually improve on that is something called adaptive optics and this has been around now for quite a while but it's absolutely revolutionary. And basically, you're adjusting for ch for the blurriness of the atmosphere. And the way they do that, they send a laser up into the atmosphere to create what we call an artificial star. It's a sodium, it's based on sodium atoms in our atmosphere. So it has to be, it has to be a yellow laser and it creates an artificial star. And basically, they make sure that the telescope is clear looking at that star. And so th therefore, they can adjust the mirror and make everything in that, patch of sky around it clear at that fraction of a second it's actually very complicated i've read all about it um, i don't need to go that deeply into it but it's amazing and it's basically allowed telescopes on earth which are you know these world-class telescopes are much much larger than the hubble thanks to adaptive optics they can also now match it in terms of resolution and so ones i mean every large one in the world has adaptive optics now there it is in action at the vlt you see that yellow laser uh, going up into the atmosphere, creating an artificial star. And then they're going to use that, adjust the mirror accordingly, and make a very, very sharp image. Well, that's about it for the size of telescopes and their resolution. 
It's uh, it's amazing what they're doing. And the next generation of telescopes is going to be even more amazing. I, I definitely want to go back to Chile and see this next generation once it's built. Thanks for listening.